Welcome to the webinar, Powering the Future, Smart Cities Leading on Climate Action, organized by the International Energy Agency and the United Nations Environment Program with the support of the Italian Ministry of Environment and Energy Security. This session will be recorded and the recording and the presentations will be available online. Please feel free to use the chat function, introduce yourselves, share your experiences and ask us questions. We will start with an opening session and then I will take you through the agenda. For our introductory session, we have Dr. Brian Motherway, Head of the Energy Efficiency and Inclusive Transitions Office at the International Energy Agency, Francesco Covaro, the Italian Special Envoy for Climate Change, and Art Sarap, Associate Program Management Officer from the United Nations Environment Program. Brian, the floor is yours. Thank you, Bida, and let me add my warm welcome to everybody joining us <coughs> this afternoon here in Paris and in Rome and in other locations. We're delighted to have you all with us today for what's a very exciting moment for us, having worked collectively with you all and many stakeholders, excuse me, <coughs> on on this work uh, driven by the IEA's Digital Demand Driven Electricity Networks 3DEN program, very generously supported by Italy. We're at a moment uh, in that project where we're sharing some very important results with you that have also been shared recently with the G7 uh, ministers, thanks to Italy's leadership on these issues. Uh, I particularly want to say we're very pleased today to be joined by Italy's Special Envoy for Climate Change, Professor Cavara. Professor, thank you for joining us. Also delighted to see Deputy Mayor Boney with us and, of course, our friends from UNEP and many other participants. We're very pleased to have you all with us today for this important event. And I do want to stress again that Italy's leadership and support has been really important in driving this agenda globally in G7, in G20 just recently, and on an ongoing basis, working, with, of course, with the IEA and working internationally. And I do want to say a word of particular thanks to our friends Anna Lydia and Alessandro, who are with us today, that have been very uh, good friends to this work and to us uh, over the last few years. We're here in the context, of course, of the historic agreement at COP28, where we saw energy move to the centre of the debate, uh, uh, long overdue, of course, and we saw global commitments to, uh, to collective ambitions around energy efficiency and renewable energy as well as others. And, and certainly in our view, the commitment to, to double progress by the end of this decade on energy efficiency has an opportunity to be a real leading edge of energy transitions in terms of we know it can be done and we know in doing so it will lower people's energy bills, it will improve quality of life, improve energy security and resilience and of course reduce emissions. And we're here today to talk about what in my mind are two key dimensions of making this possible and making this a success. The first of course is grids. Uh, we all know, I think, that modern and digital driven grids are going to be vital to safeguarding electricity security, to driving the electrification that we're going to see in clean energy transitions and to meeting targets. But we know that's going to take investment, deployment of new technology and a focus on modernizing grids through digitalization at distribution level as well as tran tran uh, transmission level and that needs a, an urgent focus now. Secondly, cities are going to be the center of transitions because that's where action happens on the ground. That's where implementation can really drive forward in terms of making things happen and engaging citizens in innovating, in pushing investment in, in, in ways that are, you know, closer to the populace, closer to people's lives, closer to the engagement that cities can have uh, with their citizens, with government. And I think cities are going to be a key actor. And of course, these two dimensions come together in a really important way, the dimension of grids and the dimension of cities. And that's why I think we really commend Italy bringing those topics together in the work we've been doing collectively and in the work we're going to share with you today because cities can innovate they can deploy new technologies they can experiment with community driven initiatives with new types of engagement with citizens and energy users and businesses and you'll be hearing about some of that experimentation and some of that great success that is already happening uh, when my colleagues share with you our new report urban energy futures uh, that we are officially launching through this event uh, and as i said has already been kindly shared by the Italian presidency of the G7 with the G7 ministers. And I think it's going to be a very important uh, focus of debate for how in this phase after COP28, 
how do we drive action? How do we take the, the commitments that governments have made and really see them land on the ground? And on the ground means city level, uh, community level, and it means the kind of technologies that we're going to be exploring today. I also want to mention, of course, that these topics will be a major focus just this time next week uh, when we are in Ni Nairobi for the IEA's ninth annual global conference on energy efficiency. We'll be delighted to welcome uh, uh, Italy there and many governments and many of you who are joining us today. I know you will be joining us either in person or online through the live uh, feeds that will be taking place next week as we debate these issues further. But in the meantime, I know today is going to be a very interesting and productive event. I want to thank you all for joining us. And in handing back to you, Vida, I want to thank you and all of the team uh, for the really great work that has taken us to this point. So thank you very much. Thank you, Brian. And now it's my great pleasure to hand over to uh, Francesco Covaro. Francesco Covaro, we had the pleasure of hosting you yesterday at the IEA High Level Dialogue on COP. And thank you for joining us today again. Thanks. Thanks very much for inviting me. Uh, International Energy Agency is the second home now that I am, I think. So, uh, first of all, thanks again for the, the organization of this event and uh, in the framework of the Digital Demand Driven Electricity Network that is financed by the Italian Ministry of Environmental and Energy Security and implemented by the International Energy Agency and the UNDP. Uh, as you know, addressing energy security is one of our ministry's mandates and it is even more relevant at the international level as the world still faces on energy crisis. Concerns about energy security are, are growing. The climate crisis adversely affects energy system negatively, impacting, ener impacting energy energy assets and supply security, especially in emerging and developing economies. Clean energy transition offers the opportunity to secure energy supplies at an affordable price and pave the way for a more sustainable future. However, we must ensure that no one is left behind to achieve global energy security. And we spoke about this also yesterday in the meeting looking uh, to the COP29. This requires increasing the flexibility and resilience of energy systems, among other provisions. Power systems, early grids, are central to those challenges. It is essential to drive investments towards more modernized and digitalized power systems and grids to ensure that all assets operate in the most efficient way possible, leverage all sources on flexibility, and better match cleaner and more volatile resources of supply and demand. And you know that uh, uh, this part is crucial also in the G7 leaders, the role of the digitalization side this particular aspect. In this context, the rule of international collaboration cannot be overstated. The driver that can help accelerate policy and technology implementation, share learnings and strengthen engagement around financing and investment. Only through collective action can we effectively address the energy crisis. In this context, over the past three years, we have worked assiduously with the International Energy Agency, which is our partner in the Trident Initiative, and I have seen significant progress. Trident has organized or participated in more than 60 webinars and virtual workshops for providing an opportunity for engagement for a large number of experts and a diverse global audience of thousands of people from the public, private, research, and non-profit sector. Trident contributed to more than 35 landmark publications, including the first guidelines on the rule of smart grids and, digital, and digitalization in emerging economies and developing countries. And it is crucial, the rule to put together private, public and the civil sector together to discuss about climate change. To further accelerate progress in this area, we are also supporting together with the United Nations Environmental Programme the implementation of pilot projects in Brazil, Colombia, India and Morocco, testing different approaches to how digitalization can contribute to flexible and resilient energy systems. Today, in line with the recent G7 Climate, Energy and Environmental held in Turin, 
that highlighted the importance of supporting smart urban clean energy transitions through our increased international collaboration, knowledge exchange, capacity building, and technology transfer, we present an exciting report on cities. We hope the discussion will benefit the audience and illuminate our future engagement. Good progress has been made throughout these and other initiatives. However, we need to strengthen an international cooperation further and speed up the process to our smart power system, especially in support of emerging and developing countries. To this end, the Italian Ministry of the Environmental and Energy Security is delighted to announce that it is financing phase two of the Digital Demand Driven Electricity Networks Initiative. And it is clear and it is important for Italy to support you in this important work. The second phase in line with the outcomes of G7 community will foster pilots fusing on Africa, including South Africa and Tunisia. So to conclude my introduction remark, let me wish you fruitful outcomes and uh, Please remember that Italy is close to you to support your work. Thanks. Thank you so much for those inspiring remarks. And let me reiterate the, the word of thanks of uh, Dr. Brian Motherway. We are very much uh, enjoyed working with Italy on this important theme, and we are very much looking forward to continuing to work with Italy as well as the broader international community. And now it's my pleasure to hand over to Art Sarab, Associate Program Manager Officer from the United Nations Environment Program. Art, please, the floor is yours. Thank you, thank you, Vida. Uh, can, can you see me? Yes, we can see you and hear you, Art. Perfect, perfect. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, nice to connect with all of you virtually. Thank you, Professor Carvaro and Brian for your kind for your kind remarks. Uh, first of all, I want to apologize. We were to be joined by Miriam Tuhami, who leads uh, the finance unit at, at UNEP. Unfortunately, she has a medical emergency and I'm, I'm standing in on her behalf. Uh, I want to start by taking the opportunity to ex extend my heartfelt thanks to the Italian Ministry for Environment and Energy Security. Uh, the Three Den project is the latest in the long line of collaboration that we've had with the Italian government uh, and UNEP to promote public and private investment in clean energy finance. So this partnership dates back to 2004, and it's really been crucial to our joint work uh, towards expanding clean energy markets and technologies over the past uh, 20 years. So we've had previous successful projects with the ministry, which have been focused on the Mediterranean region, in Tunisia and Morocco, in Egypt, Lebanon, uh, Montenegro. However, with this uh, three den projects, we really took uh, the ambition globally uh, with the focus on cutting edge uh, digital technologies and solutions. This project is also really important to UNEP. It's a collaboration with IEA, an opportunity to work together to scale up, uh, replicate project results in this really key uh, emerging sector of digitalization, uh, bridging uh, the strength of UNEP on transactional finance and IEA with their analytical work on, on the policy side. Uh, often when we think about digitalization, we might think of expensive solutions, technological interventions, which might ne not necessarily be applicable to the developing world, where the urgency is for energy sector to decarbonize while ensuring accessibility and affordability for millions of people. However, it's important to highlight here that digital technologies can provide tremendous benefits for climate and power system resilience, ensuring that energy is delivered at the lowest possible price. Digitalization of grid infrastructure, for instance, can leverage existing data to put sustainable energy where it needs to be, resulting in efficiency gains uh, as well as lower costs for, for end users. This is why we are supporting public-private consortiums as part of this Freedom Initiative to really implement these cutting edge solutions on the ground in the real world, and then using these real world results to drive uh, more substantial change uh, in social housing with electric distribution grids, and of course with industrial optimization. So we're really looking forward now, now we're at the stage um, where, we, where the pilot projects will come to a close at the end of this year. 
uh, which will further feed into the IAEA's analytical work on power system modernization, the development and dissemination of act actionable tools and policy guidance for emerging regions. Uh, we also hope that this will feed into the development of new business models, policy primers that contribute to the decarbonized, resilient, and smart power systems of the future. We're tremendously excited to see where the Treden initiative takes us next. Um, very happy to hear from you uh, about, about phase two, Professor Carvaro, uh, particularly now as we reach this crucial phase where the pilot projects are coming to a close. Uh, as you highlighted, Professor Carvaro, UNEP strongly believes that strengthening international collaboration, uh, learning by doing, and knowledge sharing is really vital to developing common standards and identifying areas where uh, innovation can be leveraged, uh, accelerating and optimizing progress in urban energy transition, and the important role to play in bringing both public and private sector together in this goal. So I'll stop here. Uh, thank you so much again to the Italian Ministry colleagues, Anna Lydia, Alessandra, for all your support, uh, to Brian, Emmy, Vida, all our colleagues over at IEA for this excellent collaboration. Uh, thanks so much. Over to you, Vida, for setting the scene. Thank you so much, Arth. We greatly value our partnership with UNEP, and we look forward to continuing to work together with you. And now it's my pleasure to take you all to, to the next part of uh, our agenda. We'll start things off with a scene setting. We'll have Anna Lydia Panzani, Senior Advisor from the Italian Ministry of Environment and Energy Security, tell us more about the Three Den project and uh, recent achievements. And then we'll have Carolina Mergli, Climate Finance Specialist from the Finance Unit of the Mitigation Branch of the Climate Change Division of UNEP, telling us more about the uh, pilot projects that Arth uh, alluded to and that also the, the Climate env Envoy mentioned. Then we'll have the opportunity to, to find more about the report that Brian was uh, talking about, where we zoom into the role of cities in driving climate action and how cities can leverage digital tools and innovative approaches and how, importantly, international collaboration can help support cities. Then we'll have a stellar lineup in terms of a panel where we have uh, people from the ground, uh, decision makers, innovators, and uh, people who make things happen, uh, discussing their recent projects, their plans, and their thoughts for topics and themes that need to be covered in the future. And then finally, we'll have the opportunity to hand over to Alessandra Firanza, Senior Advisor from the Italian Ministry of Environment and Energy Security for closing remarks. So let's move now to our scene setter. It's my great pleasure to hand over to you, Anna Lydia. Thank you, thank you, Vida. Uh, first of all, I want to thank IEA on behalf of Italian government for having organized this meeting that clearly give us the opportunity to share the state of the art of the activities carried out uh, uh, and the progress that we all together have made so far. Uh, four years ago, we have decided as government to fund this initiative, being very confident about the uh, value and important role that uh, digital technologies would play for accelerating uh, energy decarbonization, promoting energy security and energy affordability. Issues that, given the uh, historical situation we are living in are becoming more and more important. And we were not wrong. Uh, 3DN is an initiative that is uh, credible, uh, produce uh, quality content uh, and contribution, and is an innovative uh, um, hub for knowledge and insights. Uh, the last, I mean, not the least confirmation of this added value comes also from the meeting that we uh, held at the end of April in Torino for the G7 meeting of the Ministry of Climate, Energy and Environment, in which the ministry underline uh, and welcome the innovative role of 3DN initiative uh, in supporting smart urban clean energy transition through, uh, for example, increased international collaboration, uh, knowledge exchange, capacity building, and technology transfer. Based on the, uh, uh, this outcome, as uh, uh, Professor Corvaro mentioned before, uh, Italy has decided to finance the second phase of 3DN. That will give us uh, the opportunity again to jointly work uh, together 
testing an innovative approach. On one hand, with IEA in deepening our work on policies, technologies, and investment guidance. On the other hand, with UNEP in implementing additional uh, projects through uh, public call in strategic areas such as Africa that uh, has been as mentioned in a G7 communique. Uh, the report that IEA is going to present today is in line with the uh, world attention on the growing importance uh, of non-state actors like the cities in the climate action. And uh, in, uh, from our perspective, this report represents an effective answer on how to promote the nexus between cities and climate in order to accelerate uh, the transition, the energy transition, and identify concrete and sustainable solutions to keep warming below 1.5 degrees. In this regard, I would like also to mention that uh, also Italy is actively engaged in this direction through a number of initiatives and programs, for example, we are going to revise our national uh, integrated uh, energy and climate plan that we submitted last June uh, to the European Commission. In this uh, plan, we recognize the significant role of cities uh, and the local government uh, in implementing uh, a just uh, climate and energy uh, transition. Also, in the framework of National Recovery and Resiliency Plan, we, uh, we promoted many initiatives related to decarbonization that involve actively the local authorities. And many initiatives are led directly by cities, and you will uh, hear this uh, in the in the next uh, next session. So, what's coming up uh, in the in, uh, next year in the framework of 3DN? First of all, we need to activate the second phase of 3DN. We have to identify, in collaboration with IEA, new priorities in terms of the sector on which testing different approach on how uh, digitalization can contribute on flexible and resilient energy system. And we we are going to we need to launch with UNEP the public call for the financing and implementation of project uh, with a geographical focus on Africa. So we, uh, our wish clearly is that other countries would join us in this new process, either providing support or also expressing interest and giving also insight in implementing this new and innovative second phase. So thank you again for this meeting. I wish you a, a, a fruitful uh, conversation. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Anna Lydia. It's now my pleasure to hand over to, to Carolina from UNEP. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Vida, and thank you to the IEA for organizing this webinar and to all the speakers for setting the scene and, and making introductions. As you've heard um, from the previous speakers, digital technologies can provide enormous benefits for climate and power system resilience while also ensuring energy that is delivered at the lowest possible price. Uh, while there are many models and simulations that demonstrate these benefits, there is a clear need for pilot projects to quantify the impacts, as well as demonstrate in the real world that these business models can work for consumers, for businesses, and for the planet. And it is thanks to the UNEP IEA collaboration that is uh, happening with the general support of the Italian Ministry for Environment and Energy Security. Next slide, please. Um, so as, as we said, um, the initiative was launched in 2021 at Pre-COP in Milan uh, by the Italian Ministry of Energy, uh, of Environment and Energy Security. And it has brought together the collaboration of IEA and UNEP to start up to start step up global climate action and the uptake of clean energy models. Um, many transformative digital technologies and solutions for energy remain at the early stages and thus require further investments. Um, and so the role of pilot projects is crucial to de-risk these new energies by providing opportunities for learning and reducing the implementation costs uh, that can then be adapted to the local urban context. So in 2021, more precisely in September, UNEP launched uh, a call for proposal um, for showcasing uh, pilot projects. And then the, through, there was a rigorous selection process and due diligence with subject matter experts. And now um, since Q3 of 2022, sorry, uh, the four pilot projects have been under implementations. 
all of which are expected to be completed by the end of the year. And at the same time, we're working closely with all the four pilot projects to be able to share their experiences, challenges, and lessons with both the private and public sector partners, both nationally and internationally. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, now um, we come to what exactly are the four selected pilot projects about. The first one in Morocco, uh, implemented by Les Eaux Minerales d'Ulmes, which is a leading market bottling company, addresses the issues of digitalization through IA modes at two major bottling sites for forecasting energy consumption. Uh, of course, by location and by production line, it identifies energy losses and predicts maintenance action to reduce energy consumption. At the same time, Limo is working with the Moroccan Beverage Association um, in order to have insights and lessons learned from the project that can be shared with other industry players. Next, we have India, where we have a pilot project led by Panitech Power um, on digital twin technology. And it's the first time that this is being uh, implemented uh, in a distribution network in New Delhi, India. Um, the pilot project aims to provide crucial visibility on the network, empowering utilities to make real-time informed decision on the one hand and on the other to help deter the need for substantial investment in grid infrastructure, which is particularly significant when considering the escalating number of electricity consumers in India. Um, and the project overall covers 18,000 residents um, and commercial consumers. When we uh, look at Brazil, this is a completely new, different sector and it deals with social housing. Um, we have the Digital District for Flexible Energy Service Project led by Planet Smart City, which aims to demonstrate how digital solutions can improve housing affordability by optimizing ener energy usage and reducing the associated costs. The pilot seeks to demonstrate how digital solutions can seeming, seamlessly integrate digi distributed energy sources with energy storage system and dispatchable loads at consumer premises to support the grid and avoid disruptions. And this can enable consumers to actively participate in the electricity system and benefit from the remuneration services um, for energy production and for providing the ancillary services. Um, Next, we have Colombia, where we have a pilot project led by NL Grids, which aims to implement a flexibility scheme designed to alleviate grid congestion and guarantee the reliability of services in Bogota, with an ante anticipated impact extending to over 320,000 customers. Um, what the project will do is, of course, provide digital solutions that help facilitate near real-time dispatching and seamless interaction between the consumers and the distribution system operator. It will test innovative approaches for fault prediction and loss reduction within the electricity distribution system and provide a blueprint for policymakers on potential mechanisms to activate demand side flexibility in similarly uh, congested areas nationally and beyond. Next slide, please. When now we look at, at the results of these four pilot projects. The first two, Morocco and India, are reaching an advanced stage where we have preliminary results coming, which I'm happy to share with you all. First of all, in Morocco, the bottling uh, sector is highly competitive due to the high raw material costs, scarcity of resources and market change. The four bottling sites of the lead project Limo consume about 58 million um, kilowatt hours of electricity. And the first um, and the two pilot sites account for 96% of this consumption. Thanks to the implementation of the energy industrial management system developed under the pilot project, the energy consumption will be decreased by 20% by the end of 2024, which means a saving of roughly uh, 10,000 megawatt hours, taking into consideration the productive volume. Um, so with the forecasting of energy consumption and the identification of energy loss and prediction of maintenance measures and better investments have enabled LIMO uh, to further reduce emissions by 50% by 2030. 
In India, uh, Panitech led digital twin project is similarly advanced, serving around 18,000 customers in Delhi, capturing and measuring real-time data, which can be scaled up to 87% of customers served by the utility company. One of the key goals, as mentioned earlier, is to demonstrate the commercial viability of these digital solutions. It is evident that a number of tools developed by the project consortium, which includes smart plugs for residents, an interactive web portal for utility companies to help monitor the grid infrastructure, um, as well as digital solution is helping to integrate um, all these things into the grid. Next, if we look at um, the results of the pilot projects, in next slide, please. If we look at the results uh, that are coming in with Brazil and Colombia, well, these pilots started a bit later than the previous two. A lot of results are also happening, uh, which are meant to um, be further strengthened throughout the year. So the Planet Smart City project in Brazil is a groundbreaking initiative benefiting 18,000 residents near Fortaleza. By, implement, by integrating solar power and advanced energy management systems with over 60 homes that will be equipped with solar energy panels uh, and batteries. Um, and then the project in Colombia uh, is also significantly enhancing electricity reliability with over 320,000 customers that are being, um, by reducing the grid contraction through a combination of grid enforcement and innovative digital technologies. Uh, so both these initiatives demonstrate how smart technology can improve energy efficiency and stability, paving the way for broader applications and future, future growth. If we look at the next slide, uh, we've now come at a very interesting time in the project. As mentioned previously, the implementation for the pilot project will be closed in December and um, we look forward, as Mr. Covaro mentioned, to phase two of, of the Free Den initiative. Um, at the same time, we'll be working towards uh, the final the documentation of the final results of, of the lessons learned, as well as challenges faced by the pilot projects. Um, and at um, overall, we strongly believe that strengthening international collaboration Learning by doing and knowledge sharing is vital to developing common standards and identifying areas where innovation can be leveraged, accelerating and optimizing progress in urban energy transition. I'll stop here. Big thanks to the IEA team and back to you, Vida. Thank you so much, uh, Carolina, for sharing uh, the, this update on where the projects are and uh, paving the way for an exciting second phase. It's now my pleasure to hand over to two of our lead analysts, uh, Brendan Reitenbach and Emmy Bertoli, to open the covers of, uh, of the book and tell us about our report on empowering urban energy transitions. Please, the floor is yours, Brendan. Thank you, Vida. So in, in the next few minutes, uh, we'll give you all um, an overview of the main themes in this report and, and perform a bit of a deep dive into to certain areas and aspects. And, and also pull out some uh, key statistics. But, but we do invite you to, to explore this report in, uh, to, to benefit from the, the full analysis that we've uh, undertaken. So as we've heard earlier on, this report, um, Empowering Urban Energy Transitions, Smart Cities and Smart Grids, um, it, um, it builds on the, the historic announcement last year at COP28 in uh, uh, Dubai, where governments participating signed on to the UAE consensus to uh, first signal the, the need to transition away from fossil fuels to triple energy, uh, renewable energy capacity by the end of the decade, and also in the same time frame to double the annual rate of energy efficiency. And, and this report, which was produced uh, to support the Italian G7 presidency, um, lays out some of the challenges that lie ahead in uh, supporting governments to uh, achieve their uh, climate ambitions. But it also uh, lays out um, some of the, uh, the, the positive uh, opportunities that are available. And, and the truth is, when we look at this through the, the lens of cities, as uh, Dr. Modaway alluded to earlier on, 
this is where policies get implemented. And although they're set at the national level, it's down at the densely populated areas where we can see industry and populations living close together that this is where policies get implemented. Um, and uh, in this report, we, we present uh, some quantitative analysis uh, in addition to over 100 case studies uh, that present these challenges that we face looking at cross-sectoral decarbonisation, but also the, the opportunities for digitalisation and the better use of uh, data to drive innovation to better power uh, manage power systems and the complexity that's going to arise during the next phase of the energy transition. But also we look at um, how we can better place people at the centre of this uh, policy making phase uh, with the, the need to ensure energy security, energy sustainability and ultimately the affordability of energy supply. So as we can see that electrification across all sectors will reduce fossil fuel dependency and demand and this will ultimately drive the new demand for increased electricity capacity. Um, the, in the last months as well, we can see that the, in parallel to increasing demands for electricity, we're experiencing new heat waves with the last 11 consecutive months uh, being the hottest on record. And this uh, trend looks likely to continue. So this um, continued uh, effect of climate change with increased heating in parallel to more frequent storms is testing grids to the end on the edge of their operating limits. And this underlines the need to um, increase the amount of energy efficiency measures available to deploy them to reduce this demand to make grids more uh, uh, reliable and dependable. And also we explore the need to unlock um, some uh, system flexibility particularly in cities to ensure that we can uh, manage grids going forward to increase that resilience. And when we look at the state today, we can see that looking at flexibility needs, that's balancing supply and demand, that most of that today still comes from traditional thermal uh, sources of power generation and of hydropower. But as we decarbonize the power sector through uh, deploying renewable energy capacity, um, this flexibility need will need to come from new sources, from deploying large-scale utility batteries um, to behind-the-meter batteries in people's houses. But we also need to see what we can do to unlock flexibility of demand-side response. And digitalization will feature into this, and it will become a very powerful tool in how we can unlock demand-response-ready uh, tools and devices that sit behind people's meters. And looking at some of the statistics that we've pulled out of this report, we can see looking at cities that they're responsible today for around 70% of all global emissions. And last year alone, this attributed to 29 billion tonnes of CO2, setting a new record for CO2 emissions. It's ultimately necessary to drive these down fast if we want to keep that target of 1.5 degrees um, uh, achievable. Um, and already, if we look um, at the effects of heating in cities, as we can see now, it's pushing the grids to the edge of reliability. Already, 70% of cities around the world are experiencing uh, extreme temperatures and frequent storms as a result of uh, climate change. But there is, there is good potential here as well, because if we look at cities, for example, 60% of the public investment is at the sub-national level. So we can see that the money is being spent in cities and it can be used effectively to roll out programs and initiatives to support decarbonisation and increasing power system reliability from the citizen and uh, community perspective. But when we look at the analysis from this report, we know that uh, only 20% of cities today have even pledged net zero in their own uh, municipalities. And even worse, only one in 10 cities have actually stated policies to try and achieve those net zero ambitions. So looking forward, we need to look at all of the rest of the cities. There's still 900 cities today that have no net zero pledges. And we know there's a role of cities to step forward to recognize that need to implement uh, national uh, ambitions. And also, when we look forward, we all know there's been record emissions to date, but we need to try and reduce this uh, effect of increasing urbanization. 
Um, because looking to the future, in the next two decades, we can see that the rate of urbanization is going to continue to increase. In the last couple of decades, we've seen a large increases in populations and urbanization in Asia. And over the next two decades, this looks like to, con to continue. But what is a new trend is emerging is particularly when we look to sub-Saharan Africa, this is now the fastest urbanizing area on earth. And when we look at all of the, the cities together, we can see that between now and uh, 2050, the uh, average footprint, uh, uh, the, the, the absolute footprint increase of urban sprawl of all cities together is, is roughly around 1 million square kilometers. And this is equal to the size of Germany, Japan and Italy combined. And in the same uh, time period, we'll also see the, uh, the total population living in cities increasing by around 2 billion people. That's more than there are today. So, well, there's certainly challenges. We know that there is digital solutions and systems available that we can start deploying now. And these can be particularly powerful in cities where we can move in high density environments, deploying at scale and uh, looking at to how we can recognize and uh, utilize those economies of scale to optimize infrastructure and, and create new opportunities. And this is achievable as long as we have the right policies in place and also to have the right enabling environments in place. So now we're going to look at what we can do next from that city perspective. Yeah, thank you, Brandon. So um, actually from the evidence that we collected in our analysis, we can really see that local governments can adopt policies, they can uh, uh, take action like on a variety of fronts and they can, of course, like encourage smart and more inclusive uh, sustainable energy solution adoptions in different domains. So here I will give you a bit of a snapshot, but of course you can find more examples in our report. So. Uh, one example is that city governments can, can actually support the implementation of energy efficiency and, the, and support the adoption of local renewable energy sources. What we have seen, for example, in Brazil, in Rio de Janeiro in 2023, they actually became the first Latin America city to use renewable power purchase agreements to power public buildings with clean energy. Uh, and we can also see uh, around the world that cities are starting to incorporate more and more smart and clean energy solutions into their regulations and codes. For example, what we saw in, in Vancouver is that like in the city now, in the city now requires every residential parking space in new developments to feature electricity outlets for, uh, to charge EVs. Uh, and um, and of course, like uh, cities have a potential to leverage digital tools like like GIS, GIS for example, to help map uh, renewable energy potential. And they also have the possibility to actually leverage public buildings, for example, for rooftop PV installation. And across the world, we are seeing like different projects and initiatives being implemented on this front. For example, New York is planning to install 100 megawatt uh, of solar PV on city-owned buildings by 2025. And they also use digital tools to uh, actually identify the solar readiness and the potential in the city. Uh, and at the same time, Cape Town is also working uh, in the framing of the C40 cities finance facility to install a large scale solar, solar power plant that uh, will also improve, improve the city uh, level resilience. So if we're looking like more also like at the, at the um, people dimension, and we heard from, from our previous speaker that this is uh, a really key aspect of the energy transition, one approach that cities can take, uh, let's say to support this aspect is also like to leverage opportunities that are offered by community focused initiatives and, and see like the multiple benefits uh, that, uh, that these can offer uh, for the people. Uh, so um, actually the implementation of this kind of initiatives is growing, which is a very positive, uh, let's say trend and allows of course to, to share more and more lessons learned and to facilitate the implementation of um, let's say new new projects and initiatives. And just to give you uh, a number related to that, we are seeing that only in the UK, more than 200,000 people are already engaged in community level projects and these are already like generated, um, let's say, mm, substantial um, saving and, and benefits in terms of uh, reduced bills for participants worth over uh, 3 million uh, 
British pounds. Uh, and of course, like community-focused uh, projects and initiatives can help improve system efficiency, they, can, they help uh, to generate uh, energy closer to where this is consumed, they can enable uh, people to become more engaged in energy projects and support the transition, and also improve uh, access uh, to, to energy, uh, clean energy technologies across the board, and in particular, they can also help low and moderate income population to access uh, these technologies and reduce costs. Uh, and at the same time, we're seeing across some of the geographies, there are already, um, let's say, uh, pilots and testing uh, related to how these community level initiatives can actually support flexibility services. Uh, a case comes from Australia, where in a project, uh, thanks to community battery, uh, the peak demand was reduced by 85%. And of course, we're seeing a lot of benefits across the board, including uh, on on local job creation. So across the report, we actually looked at uh, some of these aspects. Um, and of course, uh, at the same time, uh, a national level, like policymakers can also help empower cities to move forward uh, towards, uh, let's say, urban clean energy transitions. Uh, as we've se seen, like in the previous uh, slide that I just presented, uh, it, it is clear that, um, of course, implemented, implementing clean and inclusive energy transition at the scale and at the, the pace that is required will be impossible if people are not placed at the center of the transition. And at the same time, we heard uh, yeah, from Brandon as well that um, actually digitalization, and in particular data, uh, is representing huge opportunities uh, to actually support and accelerate clean energy transitions in cities. And, and policymakers really have a strong role to play in, in helping to better leverage the opportunities offered by this. And as we heard from our esteemed speakers, um, International cooperation is also like key aspect of it, um, and we'll hear more, of course, like in the in the next panel. But just, uh, of, of course, to say that um, we have seen, like from our UNEP colleagues, that uh, pilot projects really play an important role in sharing lessons learned from the pilots and also supporting a faster scaling up and replic replicability of digital and innovative approaches. And, uh, and let's say ourselves at, at the IEA as part of the broader IEA technology collaboration network, uh, we have recently launched um, a technology collaboration program, particularly focused on, on cities, which offers uh, a knowledge, an international knowledge and exchange platform for cities to accelerate their decarbonization efforts. And of course, we heard from, uh, from Professor Covaro, um, that um, the key role of cities as catalysts to accelerate these uh, smart urban clean energy transitions and the role of international uh, cooperation to actually support uh, energy efficiency uh, progress was also recognized in the communique uh, of the recent G7 joint climate and, and energy ministerial. So we really think this is a very important milestone in this area. And, uh, and just to highlight the fact that um, all of this is to say that, uh, of course, like there are a lot of opportunities out there, but uh, if further efforts are not made to support cities in this process, there might be a lot of opportunities missed. And uh, this will also like pose a risk to the attainment of climate and energy uh, objectives and also might also affect uh, economic growth in the future. So I really hope that our analysis will, will manage like to, to support and, and help taking further action on this front. So moving towards uh, my conclusion, of course, just a reminder that this work is part of a bro broader program um, on uh, uh, digitalization and looking at the related measures that are needed to uh, decarbonize and, uh, and increase efficiency. And that we are not only doing analysis, but uh, really supporting uh, and we find a lot of value in, in actually facilitating peer exchanges among governments, among stakeholders from different geographies. Uh, and, and of course, like thanks to the cooperation with, with UNEP, we're really like excited to have the opportunity to leverage learnings from pilot projects. And uh, we uh, have also expanded analysis across uh, the IA, uh, providing content and, and analysis like on digitalization. So really welcome you to, to look at our resources online. And just moving to the conclusion, I would like to thank you very much for your attention. And uh, I know there is a live uh, Q&A and chat function uh, here in Zoom. So feel free to send out your questions, uh, request for collaboration opportunities, and also resources that are always very valuable for us. And you can reach out to us also at 3 uh, at 3 at iaorg 
here we are uh, including again the link to our report so we hope you will enjoy that and uh, if you want to look for further work on the decarbonizing cities please also consult our cities tcp uh, website so with that uh, i will hand over back to vida thank you thank you so much brendan and and emmy and now this takes us to our very exciting panel we have Anna Lisa Boni, Deputy Mayor of Bologna, Mark Atherton, Director of Environment of Greater Manchester Authority, Giorgia Dambelli, the Director of Mission Innovation Urban Transitions Mission, and Mena Testa, Head of Regulatory Analysis uh, of NL Grids and Innovability of NL Group. I'd uh, like to welcome all our panelists to join with their cameras, and we can kick the discussion off by starting to uh, reach out to, to Annalisa. Anna, Annalisa, we're, we're very excited about what you're doing in Bologna in the area of digital twins. We know, we know that you're at the initial stages of the project, but we see that there's lots of potential. Would you like to share with us a bit about the conception of the project, what you see happening, how will you leverage this data, and, and what are the benefits of digital t twins in the wider context of uh, decarbonization in cities? Sure. And first of all, thank you very much, uh, IEA and the Italian government, with whom we regularly work, by the way, on climate neutrality in cities. Thank you for inviting me here and uh, having this opportunity to, to talk about what we're doing. Of course, the context is that we are part of the, you know, 100 European cities that have committed to achieve uh, climate neutrality by 2030. Those crazy guys that have uh, committed to that. It's a challenging target, but it's very motivating. Uh, we have set up a climate city contract that has estimated a need for investments capital of 11 billions with actions by 92 partners for the moment, but it could be, it will be uh, larger from across the city engaged and committed through specific actions that relate to energy and both Brendan and Emmy have well described the potential of cities action in this field, mobility, green and of course digital. But so many more areas, including participation, education, and again, Amy has described this very last area very well, so that the, the approach has to be systemic to managing the climate crisis. So among all the policies and instruments, of course, we have decided to have a digital twin as well to help us. Uh, we've, been, we've decided to invest over 7 million from our own municipal budget because we believe this is a a winning bet, yeah? Uh, and also because of our specific context in a way that is very much related to our track record in terms of digital innovation, for instance, social and digital innovation together, especially uh, if you look at the, we were the first city to set up a civic um, ne internet network in Europe, uh, you know, in the 90s. Uh, we have a very solid acknowledged and international um, academic community with our public university and the presence of uh, in the city of key international infrastructures like the Technopole, our computer center, Sineca, which is very well known, but above all, we have the supercomputer Leonardo, which is the fourth biggest in the world. So, you know, this, uh, the digital twin is not, um, it is an innovative, because it is an innovative project's product, there isn't a single definition. You don't have one single thing that is the same. For, it's an off-the-shelf, an off-the-shelf kind of uh, project or product. Uh, so we have decided to develop our own concept, and that's what, it's what you were asking, you know, and, and our, our concept revolves around three main principles. One, one, it is, is that um, it is an instrument based on data analysis, of course, and technological innovation like AI uh, that has to deliver a model of the city that is at the same time complete, integrated, dynamic, and of course, with a solid forecasting policy capacity. Yeah, it has to be an instrument for us to be able to forecast. Uh, it entails a, a process that needs to be, as I said, dynamic, this is really important, and is in permanent evolution and change because it is based on research, experimentation, monitoring actions, uh, because the goal of the digital twin is really to impact on our city administration's governance and modify this governance so that all the strategic decisions that we take 
can be done in a sharing mode with the stakeholders and local community. So it's an instrument that has to, you know, be based on that. And also based on, also monitored, we have to be able to monitor it through a series of indicators. And then third, it's a public policy in a way, because the digital twin is part, it's part of a, a wider strategy that wants to raise the competence in a, in a way of the entire local community on you know what it means what what are the big what are big data what are new technologies so it's really about generating awareness on the value of data what what do they mean you know even their own data that they share and so make sure that these data are used in an ethical and democratic way so the digital twin is not just a simple reproduction of the urban system you know a copy it is a copy, a very accurate copy of the city, but it's in its all uh, in, it, in in all its um, elements of complexity, and it wants to capture its social and environmental complexity. It has to evolve and co-evolve with the city itself, because, as I said before, it feeds itself with uh, real-time data that represent the city, and it has to adapt. Uh, you know, at the same time, be able to uh, do forecasting analysis that can um, influence strategically the development and evolution of the city. So looking at other, other models across Europe, because many cities now are developing digital twins, I think that our specificities are related again to three elements. It's civic value, uh, so we haven't acquired this product from an enterprise as such. We are building it with, through a partnership made of research institute, ourselves, the public policy, public uh, sec, I mean, public institution, and Bologna is leading on it so that we can guarantee that this twin, uh, this digital twin is really based on the needs of the city and that who develops it and who manages it has to be completely uh, has to be completely aware of what it is and its potential and its use okay so that's a really important element the second is that yes the methodology has to be has to be applied uh, as a step by step process where we have an approach of research innovation that with the time will make this uh, digital twin uh, you know more complex and sophisticated and third and last the ethical dimension as i said before really trying to make sure that we 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 manage and we use the data in a very transparent way using uh, you know ethical algorithms that can really protect the the data so with data protection is a very strong uh, element uh, I mean, I could go on, but these, I think, are the main uh, elements, and I don't want to take too much time. So, thank, thank you. you so much, Annalisa. I, I, I could also go on listening to you about the, this fantastic innovation and the transformative role and the the ongoing evolution and, and how it will change how decisions are made across the board within cities and be a powerful tool to accelerate decarbonization. Thanks so much. I'd like to jump over to Mark now. Uh, because we have been hearing great things about what's happening in Manchester. If you'd care to share a bit about what's happening in, in the Net Zero project. Yes, thank you. And um, uh, as Anna said, thank you for inviting. Um, so Greater Manchester, as you probably know, is in the north of England. Um, and we have set a carbon neutral target by 2038. What I want to do in the next few minutes is just talk to you about the importance of data and how we have used data to uh, provide key insights to allow us to do some targeting uh, and uh, some uh, specific KPI measuring, how we can use uh, transforming that modeling data into tangible policies uh, and specific uh, action plans. We've developed local energy plans as a result. How then we're gonna use data to monitor and deliver those plans uh, and to help us uh, inform the, the way that we move forward. And then finally, uh, about KPIs and carbon budgets and how it, how that might impact on what we do in the future. I will be very quick. So in terms of how we've 
use data. We, we have been on a journey over the last five years. We set out our first five-year environment plan in 2018. And it's fair to say we used the best available data that we had avail available to us. We developed an algorithm uh, with the UK government, a, a program called Scatter, which was the first of its kind in the UK. And it allowed you to estimate carbon emissions at a city regional scale. And that's now being used in uh, over 50, I think nearly 100 local authorities in the UK. What that allowed us to do was set a science-based target, but more importantly, understand our ability to be able to get close to that science-based target, which is incredibly challenging. So that was the first um, intelligent use of data that we'd really applied to this, where we tried to take national data sets and bring them down to the local level, and then meet them with bottom-up data from real life experience of how buildings operate or how much energy is being generated in the city region. So models are great uh, and we did use it to set our first five-year environment plan but they have their limitations. The data is variable in terms of its quality. Uh, we have found that national data is aggregated in such a way which doesn't allow us to use it very well at the city regional level and we're talking to our national government about that. But equally when you're talking to people who own buildings or, or manage energy systems Sometimes the data that they think is true turns out not to be true when you dig under the, under, the, um, under the covers of it. So one of the lessons we've learned is to treat data with respect, but also with some skepticism and to check and recheck data because models are only as good as the data that you put into them. There are uh, five areas I would say that we have used data really successfully. One is to understand the scale of the challenge that we face. Uh, and put it into terms that people can really understand. The second is to understand the overall approach that we're going to adopt. What choices do we have to make? Uh, reflecting on national actions and how we can bring them to the local level. The third is looking at our priorities. So which sectors are most important to reduce emissions across the conurbation, which is more important, energy efficiency in homes or transport or both. Um, it informs our actions. So what types of actions might we need in each of the sectors and then Finally, it informs our goals. As I mentioned, we developed local energy plans, one for each of the local authorities in Greater Manchester. And what these do is set at a fairly granular level, an understanding of how the energy system has to change between where we are now and our goal of 2038 carbon neutrality. And it does so on a GIS based system. So although the maps are fairly high level, you can dig right down into almost a street by street approach. Utilizing again, the best data that we have available, what they, allow us to do in, in the bigger sense of the word is understand and cost that transition. So we now have a reasonable idea of how much a low carbon transition is going to cost the city region. It's a big number, it's 64 billion. Um, however, we also know that 70% of that will um, be undertaken as business as usual. So really what you're talking about is a differential of about 19 billion. What we're working with uh, UK government and indeed the urban transition mission, you'll hear from George in a minute on, is how do we then secure green finance to be able to su support that transition? How much do we bring in private finance? Now, this is where the digital twin uh, comes in because we're being supported by Urban Transition Mission to look at how we transfer the local area energy data, which is quite static GIS based, into a digital twin. And what we want to get out of it is better visualization. So it helps us communicate the transition to our residents and our businesses but also to be able to ask the so what question, what scenarios can we put in to see whether if we make a change in this direction, will it have a bigger impact or lower impact? And I think we've seen many models of uh, digital twins over the last few years. And really what we want to do is uh, develop a light touch uh, version that we can kick, understand its limitations and where it could uh, go further. And then we probably uh, do as Anna has suggested and, and go into something a lot more detail from the city region. This builds on some work um, which plays into the IEA report that's being launched today. So a couple of years ago, we, we ran a programme with the Japanese government, which was called Sustainable Communities Greater Manchester. It didn't really describe the project. It worked with 600 social homes in Greater Manchester to put in demand side response, uh, digital technology. So in effect, it was putting heating systems into people's homes, but allowing them to be remotely controlled to be able to move energy demand away from the peak point. In the, part of this was about um, moving away the, the peak load, which is forcing us to invest in the grid, which is very expensive. But also as we move more into a world where we have prosumers rather than consumers, 
it allows you to start thinking about how people who um, use energy can also uh, generate energy and utilize the grid to be able to purchase energy at a, a time which is more, which is cheaper or more efficient. And so we, we've, we're building on that program by using 5G technology to look at how those systems can be uh, better integrated in with a monitoring process. And then finally, because I know I'm out of time, um, we will use that data and together the work with the digital twin to understand how we monitor progress against our targets. So we break our targets down into energy generation, energy efficiency, energy storage, um, by tenure and, and typology of building. Um, we have programs to look at how we can generate energy both on buildings um, and um, from uh, heat sources, uh, heat networks, and, and also ground-based PV. And it's about monitoring now our progress against the targets that we can make. And by undertaking some of that, um, some of the key learnings from the IEA report, looking at how we use data to be able to monitor our progress towards not just a carbon neutral city, but a smart city. I hope that's useful. Thank you so much, Mark. Again, there's lots I want to question, lots I want to find out much more about. This is fantastic, and especially for emphasizing, of the, again, the, the role of data, but, but also the, the need to develop new methodologies, new approaches, new capacities to manage that data, as, as well as uh, the importance of uh, utilizing data and evidence-based approaches to achieve targets and to be able to monitor progress on those targets. So thanks so much. I'd like to jump over to Georgia now. And I, we've heard from two fantastic European cities that are doing fantastic things uh, within your wide network of cities. Can you tell us uh, something about interesting things happening in other parts of the world and uh, how, uh, how countries in um, how cities in emerging and developing countries could draw from the experiences and lessons learned in other jurisdictions. Please, Georgia. Thank you very much, uh, Vida, and thank you colleagues for the invitation, in particular colleagues from the IEA, not only for inviting me today, but also for the continuous great support that you've been providing uh, over the past years to the urban transition mission as well. Um, we are a global uh, initiative, uh, that it's part of mutual innovation, looking into catalyzing a decade of action and investment, in particular in research, development, and demonstration of solutions that can make our energy transition more affordable, more attractive, more sustainable, and accessible for all. And in particular, our mission is working to really empower cities on their journey uh, to a more uh, sustainable future through transitioning to a net zero, but also resilient and, of course, inclusive uh, situation for, for the society uh, across the world that our communities are representing. Um, we are working currently with uh, a cohort of 98 uh, cities from 40 countries across the world with a good balance between Global North and Global South, I would like to say, and also with a large variety in terms of, of sizes of, of communities. We work with a town like Shachawan in Morocco, 60,000 inhabitants and places like uh, for example, New Delhi or, or Rio de Janeiro. So just to give you a little bit of flavor. Now, what was the first step that we took as a mission was to really have a little bit of an understanding of how we can help uh, our cities to solve uh, the complex puzzle that is an urban transition. And we started by analyzing in particular the priorities uh, that they have in terms of these wicked problems that they haven't quite managed to, uh, to start solving although they have commitment, although they have great plans that they would like to, of course, move forward to implementation. And interestingly enough, although we can change from different sizes and shapes, as I said before, there are clear underlining challenges that are applicable for all. Uh, one, uh, and first and foremost, relates to, uh, in particular, collaboration across level. So this idea of reinforcing multi-level collaboration, cross-sectoral collaboration, Mark hinted to the importance of working with the private sector, for example, but also, uh, as Annalisa was saying, to engage the citizens. This is an everlasting challenge, I would say, that we can see everywhere in the world. Data is the second biggest challenge that we have uh, mapped across the globe once again. It goes from maybe the lack of capacity in collecting the data, the lack of access to the data that is needed, but in particular, this maybe not so developed often ability to cross-check, compare, integrate data 
is made available and to be able also to access tools that can help the cities in forecasting and creating valuable scenarios that can inform their policy. The third biggest need that we heard across the board, and I think it was also mentioned in your report and in particular by Brendan, it's the financing piece. Uh, of course, the big transitions that we are embarking on will require substantial investment. And very often our cities are still very much in need of technical assistance, of uh, um, support in developing bankable projects, but also understanding better how to work with the private sector and create opportunities for uh, blended finance. Um, in terms of the core sectors uh, that relate to the energy transition that they, are, again, across the board, uh, being flagging as the most difficult to kind of tackle, we have first and foremost, and foremost transport and mobility. Uh, so the idea of reducing emission, but also making this uh, um, this infrastructure more resilient and more usable uh, for citizens in the different communities across the world. So there are lots of open questions about how to expand the amount of electric vehicles, for example, being utilized. Lots of cities that are looking into hydrogen as a new solution, but maybe not the full uh, picture on how it is possible to use this technology uh, to really support uh, locally public transportation, for example. And again, lack of data here and lack of interoperability very often across the different uh, sectors and systems are coming up as a, a key issue that they are flagging. In terms of renewable energy production, other big challenge, um, lots of questions around how to strengthen and improve, of course, uh, the grid, but also lots of questions open about digitalization. We talked about the great potential that digitalization has, but a lot of our cities are asking themselves, what type of governance do we need to have when it comes to a smart cities that we are developing? How do we protect the data? How do we protect our infrastructures and ourselves from cyber attacks? So I think the potential is really clear for all of our cities across the, the, the board, but there are some open questions also on how to leverage this potential without uh, incurring into any sort of risk. And then finally, I want to mention energy efficiency in, in particular and combining that with cooling. You have heard that before from previous speakers. Uh, there is, of course, a, a big effort that cities across the world are undertaking to ensure most often thermal comfort uh, for their own citizens, not only in social housing, but also to help communities across the board to meet these targets. And in particular, we are often and more often hearing uh, a new terminology being uh, adopted after uh, energy poverty, mobility poverty, more and more we are hearing about cooling poverty. So combining uh, this energy in infrastructure and the possibility also to utilize the grid uh, across the board, across sector, to operate these infrastructures, but also to adopt solutions at the same time that can ensure the resilience of these infrastructures, as well as uh, be integrated with strategies like, for example, to tackle extreme heat. Now, the good news is uh, that, as you mentioned, a lot of cities are already learning from great experiences like the one that you heard today from Bologna and Greater Manchester, but also are bringing to the table a lot of new ideas uh, that can be uh, discussed and they can be kind of an inspiration for others across the world. So I'll mention just a few. Uh, Rio de Janeiro, it was mentioned already a few times before. Uh, they have developed a, a project called Solar Carioca. Uh, the idea was to amplify and, and scale up uh, solar power generation, in particular by installing a solar farm on a deactivated landfill. Uh, now, this specific project is providing energy to 45 schools within the city network and, dif and 15 uh, different units of emergency care across the, the state. Uh, the city is also developing a whole brand new low emission uh, district. Uh, they are looking into having net zero buildings being, um, let's say, uh, developed in that area, combining biodiversity policies, natural-based solutions, and of course, more and more opportunities to provide that specific district with as much renewable energy as possible and to facilitate uh, the the setup of different uh, charging stations for electric vehicle to again utilize this opportunity to improve local public transport. Um, going a little bit uh, 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 now east, I'd like to give an example from Africa and how, for example, these cities are also thinking very much strategically about how do we safeguard the infrastructures that we have, especially when we are looking into optimizing them and improving them in the future. And here I would like to bring an example from the city of Kelimane. 
city of Kalimane in Mozambique has been making uh, their protection of, uh, um, the, of, of the soil through the mangroves, one of their branding uh, approaches to really ensure the soil, the soil erosion, but also flooding is being curtailed as much as possible. And to, of course, try to prevent um, their infrastructure to, to collapse and, and to be damaged by the very frequent flooding that they are suffering. I'll conclude with just one more example from Surat and, uh, uh, and, and talk to you a little bit about the issuing of green bonds in particular to make sure that public sector and private sector and even citizens can invest in green infrastructure. The ultimate goal there is not only to create new, especially green and blue infrastructure, but also to use the green infrastructure that are already existing uh, to really host also production of renewable energy. So across the board, many different ideas and many, of course, uh, insights the cities can share with one another to really uh, reach our objective of a more sustainable future. Vida, I can I can TV you. I don't know if the other participant can hear the the main room. No, okay. So, no, so. we can't. Apologies, no, apologies. Ah, yeah, okay, perfect. Just to be sure, it was not only my problem. So, so what I was saying, so so Georgia, thank you very much. Uh, fantastic, lots of great insights there. A lot to follow up on, and uh, especially for emphasizing. Uh, the, the commonalities that many cities share in terms of their climate journeys and the opportunities to, to learn from each other and, and to build on already existing results and systems and platforms. And I'd like to hand over to Mena. Uh, Mena, you, you've been working on a very exciting project uh, in Italy, the Flexibility Project Edge, and it would be great to hear more about how you've been leveraging digital technologies, how you've created an interface with people and some of the lessons learned there. And we also previously heard about uh, the exciting NL Flex project in Colombia. So if you'd like to mention something about the, the implementation on, on the ground, uh, that would be absolutely fantastic. Over to you, Mena. Yeah, thank you very much, Vida, and thank you to all IEA for this invitation for the whole involvement in the Trident uh, program. So uh, going straight on the point, I'd like to focus on uh, these two projects that are also mentioned in the IEA report. Uh, the, um, and focus before on the Italian one, since I heard already something about the Colombian one by uh, previous speaker from UNEP, so probably it would be interesting to start from this um, Italian pilot project that uh, was born from a, a regulatory stimulus, we can say, because Arera, the Italian authority, um, set the rules uh, already in 2021 to allow the SOS to experiment local flexibility markets. We project aimed exactly at providing these services to a distribution network, defining from planning methods uh, along product features, procedures for procurement and operation. So, uh, the Italian DSO of, of NL, that is a distribution, decided to participate in this experiment phase and to implement this project in urban areas. So why cities and urban context? Actually, we know uh, also uh, in the introduction on the report, we stress the point that the cities are often the, the first to implement new digital enabled systems. So the areas for the project have been identified, uh, indeed, considering the risk of congestion on the grids to, due to high degree of industrialization, electrification in, this, in the, that area. At, on the other side, on the presence of uh, prosumers, of thousands of prosumers connected to the medium and low voltage networks, and the presence of other users eligible for providing this kind of local flexibility services. 
So according to this criteria, four areas in different regions of Italy have been selected uh, that are just for curiosity, Benevento, Cuneo, Foggia and Venice also, so from north, north to south. And, um, and the final aim of the project was exactly to test the use of services to solve this congestion. Uh, how does it work really? Um, the services can be offered by any customer or aggregate set of customer that complies with the technical requirement and passes the pre-qualification test. So far, in terms of progress, two seasonal rounds of tendering have been already completed and the registration phase for the autumn 2024 round is uh, currently open. And um, you were wondering also about digital technologies. Uh, actual uh, VIDA, they are key for the implementation of the whole project uh, because we rely on digitalization from forecasts of needs until market-based procurement and the utilization of resources real time. So uh, the, the project rely on a third party platform. Uh, in this platform, exactly, we have all the information and data related to the needs uh, with technical requirement, with, uh, for example, availability time windows and uh, request capacity. Uh, through the platform, it's possible to manage the phase of registration, offer, and it, it awards, finally, resources in a pay-as-bid competition, uh, both for their availability and then for a actual uh, utilization. Final, the resources and the contract details are automatically and loaded in NL DERMS. DERMS is the, the core of this uh, um, uh, way to uh, provide, the way to uh, work on this market because it's the digital tool in charge to forecast grid congestion. And when this congestion are foreseen, the services are allocated to solve that criticality, of course, in a technical and economic optimal way. So uh, we are really keen to see the, probably we need to progress uh, a bit more to have a very lesson learned for the project, but we are uh, really um, keen to, uh, to see and to put really in the uh, regime phase of the, the project. I don't know, regarding Colombia, if you, if I can spend a few, few words, because I don't want to repeat what has been already described in the previous speech. So I really want just to stress a few, few points. So we mentioned this project in Bogota. Uh, it's very interesting to, to know that this region is currently facing a congestion event. So uh, they have outages intensified by uh, increasing electricity demand, resulting exactly from the expansion of industrial and commercial sector, also with the potential for growth. So um, it, it has been analyzed that usually they have a condition of two faults per year, and these two faults involve disconnected, so the, don't provide uh, supply of energy to 320,000 of clients. Okay, clients that are mainly residential and families, 70% of this amount are families. Okay, and uh, they are without energy also until six hours. Okay, because they need to fix the outage because there is no other source of firm power in the area. To address these circumstances, it was planned already a feeder reinforcement, but it takes time because there are bottleneck in permitting, delays. So finally, the alternatives has been uh, uh, studying how, with the demand response, it was possible to, um, uh, let's, let's say, solve or uh, reduce a lot the problem. So the simulation demonstrates that only with the tier two clients involved in the mechanism, it was possible to, um, to benefit the whole clients, the whole 300,000 uh, 300, uh, clients, because this customer, have a very high energy consumption. More of them are uh, industrial, big companies, so they can offer a significant decrease in system demand. And it's possible in a, in a cities because they are industrial, commercial. There is also one government uh, inside the, the provider. And so the project exactly uh, try to test this voluntary disconnectable demand mechanism, empowering this customer to disconnect and be remunerated for contributing to this 
improvement in quality of services. So through a message, they are uh, directly requested to uh, reduce their consumption and are paid in proportion to time and power they have, uh, they have reduced. Uh, so as already said, this project is exactly in the face of contracting and it's ready to start in June and we, it will operate until uh, December. I hope to be on time, but I really wanted to stress just a few very practical numbers and uh, features of these uh, two projects. Thank you so much, Mena. Very interesting uh, uh, findings and approaches, and, and again, uh, a good potential for, for replicability and scalability across both those projects. Uh, we're, we're almost at time, but I'll take my prerogative as, as a moderator to put you all on, on the spot once again for a quick fire uh, session. And uh, back to international collaboration, we heard from the Climate Envoy, we heard from the other speakers how important is international collaboration. So from each of you, I'd ask one to, two, one to three things. What, what, what are priorities? What could we do in terms of international collaboration that would be meaningful, useful and valuable? I'll start with you, Annalisa. But first of all, continue the collaboration that is already started, at least among cities. Uh, we are doing this through networks, uh, you know, like EuroCities, but others, and understanding what are the challenges and uh, the solutions and the things that basically cities are uh, developing and going through uh, to improve and inspire ourselves and our own models is very, very useful. And uh, keeping a very strong synergy both with international organizations like yours, but also the our national, respective national governments uh, is also very important because it's part of what, you know, we call the multi-level governance. So a, a multi-level governance that has to be um, enabling, you know, basically cities to um, uh, to manage this transition, yeah, to manage the, this, the, 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 the climate and energy transitions. If we don't have a functional, strong, uh, coordinated, coherent and enabling uh, framework in terms of, uh, in, you know, policies, uh, uh, legislation, instruments, then there will be, there will be more difficulties in, uh, in getting to the ground and making this happen. So I think that, uh, you know, the relations that we have with our government is is good but it can it can be even uh, uh, reinforced uh, the 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 synergy that we've started now with you i mean i would be very happy to continue it and also you know within our different networks learning from each other is a, a fundamental uh, thing to do fantastic thanks so much so jumping over to mark three things um so I, I think this is an interesting question. If we look at how all cities are decarbonizing, the interrelationship between energy demand and energy supply is becoming ever more integrated and ever more important. Um, and that really means that we have to start considering uh, breaking out of silos in how we manage infrastructure. So we can't think of transport infrastructure, energy infrastructure, um, the natural environment as another ecosystem and our built infrastructure as separate things. They are all interrelated and their use uh, and potential opportunity pr to produce energy need to be seen in a systemic way. And I think this is at the heart of the report that's being launched today. However, my, uh, my key point here, I think, is around making that easy. And one of the challenges we have is uh, from very um, usual competition processes, we have technologies that don't always talk to each other. Mm -hmm. So really we need in the process of how we design our technologies, we need to have either regula regulation or agreements so that these technologies, whether they be storage technologies, generation technologies, efficiency technologies, smart building technologies, they have to be plug and play. They have to be simple and easy to do. They all need to be able to interrelate. It doesn't destroy competition. It just ensures that different technologies will work within a given system. I know that's not three, but it is an important point and I'll stick with that one. Fantastic, Mark, thanks so much. So now it's going to be even more challenging to come up with three. 
Georgia, go. Thank you very much. So um, maybe three points from my side as requested. The first one is around the scalability of the solutions that we have. I think this is still very much a, a dominant uh, challenge. So I think cooperation should also help us accelerate market uptake of the solutions that we are discussing so that they are not only deployed more widely, but also that we can reduce the cost of these solutions and make sure that more and more cities across the world uh, can actually uh, access them. The second is about furthering skills and technical capacity of local governments and all the different uh, partners that are working with them to support this transition. And I think that this is a particularly important when we're talking about cooperation and transfer of knowledge, transfer of specific technologies uh, from the north to the south, from the south to the north, and, and, and across all of these different uh, uh, patterns. I think this is uh, something that is essential and cooperation can really help us translate uh, this advancement in a meaningful manner. And then last, the, the, the third point is uh, somehow related also to this. There are a lot of cities that are decarbonizing because they have a long history of uh, their sustainable development or, or not so sustainable development that they would like to improve for the future. But there are a lot of new and rapidly urbanizing cities that, are, that have a lot of challenges. They are blessed, but also at the same time cursed with being completely a blank slate. So I think Cooperation here should also help this new community or these communities that are tripling, quadrupling in size in a very short uh, time frame to really learn how to make not make the same mistakes that we have made in the past and really come up with new solutions. Thank you, Georgia. Three fantastic points. Over to you, Mena. Yeah, I'll try to be very quick, but then I'll stay on my project because uh, first, thinking to Italy, I think that market and regulatory models to be implemented that leverage on testing, demonstrating with pilot project, it's a successful scheme. Italy is a, a demonstration of that. So uh, it's a first point for me. Staying on regulatory, I'm thinking to planning. So uh, enhance the framework for long-term investment plan, incentivize the anticipatory investment for grids for, for cities. So thinking in advance to what the cities will, will need and which will be the electrification part and uh, um, the needs to avoid any thinking to rid any congestion, any uh, crisis on the distribution to cover needs for expansion, modernization, digitalization. So measuring policies for climate adaptation and resilience, of course, someone mentioned before, uh, resilience, it's uh, among these, uh, these needs. Third, last but not least, as usual, uh, it's funding. Secure and mobilize the funding. 3 then project, it's a very good uh, example and best practice for that because funding is necessary. The project in, at the beginning doesn't have any any income in the in the first year and it needs to be operated. I'm thinking to Colombian project. Uh, we really need to demonstrate there is no scheme in the regulation that uh, incentivizes them and response. There are no um, awareness from regulatory authority on that. So it's very important to have funding and to be uh, together presenting results. So also with the IA to be uh, to have the support as we are doing, but to do also um, engagement and uh, dissemination uh, in for the regulatory authority to have this kind of uh, in instrument, let's say, tools to improve the, the networks uh, in place and at regime. Thank you so much, man. A really good points there, especially anticipatory investments and, and closer alignment between urban and uh, power system planning going forward, which is a very strong theme that we've been covering in the report. I'd like to thank all our panelists so much. There are so many questions that I would like to answer, ask you, uh, but we're running out of time. We see we've also had a lively chat with questions. We will collect all those questions and uh, uh, develop uh, an answer and, and share with you. And now it's my great pleasure to hand over to Alessandra for closing remarks, please. Thank you very much, Vida. Uh, thank you very much to uh, the AEA for organizing this event and to all the, the participants uh, who attended uh, the, the webinar. But first of all, let me thank all the speakers. Uh, our colleagues from the IEA and uh, UNEP uh, work uh, together with us uh, uh, on a daily basis almost uh, on this challenging uh, experience, uh, which is the, the 3DN. And we are uh, very happy that uh, we will soon see the second phase uh, starting. 
Uh, UNEP uh, uh, mentioned the importance of the pilots, uh, uh, which are already ongoing, and we heard also from Enel uh, uh, and uh, other uh, uh, speakers the importance of uh, concrete uh, uh, implementation on the ground uh, of uh, uh, of these these principles, which are, let's say, the the tool, the means to. Uh, localize what is being decided uh, uh, at uh, at the highest level. We have heard at the beginning mentioning uh, uh, last uh, uh, COP28, uh, where uh, engagements uh, were taken by uh, by the international community. But then we 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 need to to bring down uh, those commitments and and figure out how to uh, to make them work and. Uh, this this uh, uh, this report focusing on on cities uh, uh, is very interesting, and I I'm really thankful for for the great work carried out by the IEA uh, on collecting uh, concrete examples. So we worked together, and I remember when we uh, were revising the the drafts. Uh, and uh, could witness uh, uh, the, the many efforts uh, in uh, understanding where to find uh, examples that would fit into the narrative uh, of what we were, uh, you were. Uh, what is interesting from my uh, personal and professional point of view is the overall message of opportunities. There are problems. We have heard uh, the, the many uh, uh, challenges related to uh, the, the, the daily life of uh, making cities work uh, regarding uh, energy, uh, energy availability, electricity, uh, dispatching. Uh, we have heard uh, uh, words like uh, congestion, bottlenecks, and so on. But thanks to uh, the examples also uh, shared by by the speakers from uh, Bologna, from uh, uh, um, uh, Mission Innovation, from uh, from Enel, and from uh, uh, Manchester, uh, whom I again thank for for their contribution. Uh, we understood that there is room for improvement, uh, but there is also an opportunity, many opportunities actually, uh, to, to move on and to improve the capacity uh, of cities to, to deal with complexity. And also thanks to uh, digitalization, uh, thanks to the digital twins. Um, I heard one of the, the, the last speakers mentioning the uh, uh, the need to have plug and play technology as well. I like I like this this uh, uh, suggestion very much, and uh, also the the coupling uh, technology with co benefits with green and blue infrastructure, uh, because. Uh, acting on on a, a local level at the urban scale uh, means finding co-benefits uh, and uh, uh, improving uh, green infrastructures, blue infrastructures uh, can really support not only mitigation but also adaptation uh, on on a local level. Uh, so thank you very much to uh, to all the speakers, and again uh, uh, thank to the um, IEA and UNEP for the fantastic adventure that uh, we are uh, uh, walking together, and we look forward to to the next steps and following opportunities to uh, discuss together on concrete success stories. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alessandra. I'll just uh, join Alessandra's thanks by a shout out to the team here at the IEA. Uh, thank you for all the hard work and uh, for making this webinar possible. Thank you, Lisa, for organizing. And uh, I will thank all our participants, all our speakers. Thank you for joining us. We will follow up. We'll send you the recording. We're open to your suggestions. We'd love to continue these conversations. We'd love to hear more about your projects and your ideas on where there are gaps, where the IEA can, can help. Uh, accelerate progress and uh, develop analysis, insights, and guidance that is useful. Thank you very much and have a nice afternoon. Thank you very much to everyone. Thank you. Thank bye -bye. you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you, Aya. Bye. Thank you. Bye.